Hello, my dear students. Good morning. Rather, I should call my dear doctors because many of you are already doctors and looking up to pursue the higher education. My good wishes, just like MD ZH, have been always with you, and I'm sure my classes will be interactive and will be useful to you. I'm going to talk today about narcotic analgesics. And I hope you remember whenever I say narcotic analgesics, I'm going to take you right back to your pharmacology days. Let's try to understand the pharmacological basis of action of narcotic analgesics, the important uses, the agonist and the antagonist. Narcotic analgesics have the prototype drug morphine. Morphine is an age-old drug and has been used since 1800s. But when the hypodermic syringe came in, in 1857, the use flourished much, much more. The major action of morphine is on the central nervous system and on the spinal cord. It produces potent analgesia with the help of the mu receptor. It's a mu receptor agonist. Need to remember all the drugs who are going to be narcotic analgesics are likely to be mu receptor agonists. There are four types of receptors, mu, kappa, sigma and delta. And all of them are playing role in the actions of narcotic analgesics. Opioid receptor stimulation leads to decrease in the calcium concentration. And that leads to decreased glutamate and that finally leads to decreased excitation. So narcotic analgesics are the central nervous system depressants. When you take this medication, you get a sense of euphoria. That's a false sense of well-being. You start dreaming. And that's why the name came from the Greek god of dreams, Morpheus. Let's go ahead for the details of the narcotic analgesics. What are the terminologies which are going to be used? We always use the words agonist, antagonist, partial agonist. I hope you remember. We use these words when we were on the general pharmacology modules. But in this particular chapter, you're going to get some confusing words. Like a word, mixed agonist, antagonist. What I would do is, I would take you to the screen board and I would tell you the plan, what's going to happen. For example, we have a type of receptor, and I'm going to put it here, the receptor. And in front of this, I'm going to make a table which is, which is going to show was the agonist and was the antagonist. Suppose if there would be only one receptor, then I would write, this is the name of the receptor, let's take for example, mu receptor. Then I would write, this drug is an agonist of this receptor and another drug is an antagonist of this receptor, it was fine. Or in addition, I would say, a particular drug is a partial agonist of this receptor. What happens when you come to the narcotics? It's not only one kind of receptor. You have a mu receptor, you have a kappa receptor, you also have one more receptor, that's a delta receptor, and your sigma receptor. So you're going to get so many receptors here, an agonist and antagonist here. What? If a particular substance is agonist at one receptor and is antagonist at another receptor, what are you going to call it? You cannot just call it agonist because it's antagonist somewhere else. You can't just call it antagonist. You also can't call it partially agonist. So if a drug is stimulating one kind of receptor, is agonist here and is blocking another receptor, so it becomes antagonist. So I am going to call this drug a mixed agonist antagonist. I hope you understood the concept and we are going to develop this in the presentation further. Let's have a look at the slide. What other terminology we are going to use? The first word is opioid agonist. You know agonist is a stimulant, it is going to activate. So opioid agonist will be a drug which activates some or all types of opioid receptors and it's not going to block any receptor. So that's an opioid agonist. The second kind of drug, have a look at the slide, may be a partial agonist. It's a drug that can activate opioid receptor, but the response is submaximal. That's what we say about a partial agonist. The intrinsic activity is going to be less than that of agonist. That's fine, but still it's an agonist. 
the next word is going to be mixed agonist antagonist that's what i was explaining to you here now let's understand the definition a drug that activates some receptor subtypes and blocks some other subtypes so for example stimulates this receptor but blocks another receptor is going to be mixed agonist antagonist and the last one is going to be a pure antagonist is a drug that blocks all types of sub receptors all sub types of the receptor so you going to get opioid agonist partial agonist mixed agonist antagonist and pure antagonist i have prepared a very beautiful table for you and you can have a look at this particular table don't get clumsy don't get scared looking at this big table look at it whatever i did here the same thing i have done on this slide so you have uh, let's go and follow the columns the first column is showing the type of receptors mu receptor kappa receptor delta receptor and sigma receptor in the first block there is agonist and the second block is showing the antagonist and i have used typical colors so that you are going to remember these things definitely let's come to the first box that is the mu receptor agonist there are strong agonists examples are morphine pethidine pethidine is also called meperidine okay morphine pethidine methadone levorphanol fentanyl alfentanil sufentanil remifentanil etc so what is it containing it's containing morphine the prototype substance is containing another drug that's called pethidine or meperidine next important substance is methadone you might have heard it this drug is used in the management of morphine addiction and the next one is fentanyl and its derivatives i hope you remember the chapter of general anesthesia uh, i hope you remember the routes of administration you remember the transdermal therapeutic system in which i showed you the fentanyl patch so that's that fentanyl these are all strong agonist next there are moderate agonist which have been shown here is oxycodone and your codeine i i hope you heard codeine we discussed codeine when we discussed cough because it's a cough suppressant the next is weak agonist and you have propoxyphene is a weak agonist and at the end i have written capital p capital a this stands for partial agonist and the name of the drug is buprenorphine and it's got a long duration of action so what we saw on the first box is all the mu receptor agonist and these drugs are most important these are the narcotic analgesics very commonly used for the purpose of analgesia now let's go down to kappa receptors in the kappa receptor you have four drugs shown i hope you looking at the slide nalbufen pentazosin butorphenol and nilorfen right but the same four drugs have been written in the same font in the same style at some other places let's go and search i'm taking my cursor here look at this this is nalbufen is a kappa agonist and if i follow this arrow it is taking me here nalbufen is also mentioned here as an antagonist of the mu receptor are you getting what i tried to show on the on the green board it means nalbufen is agonist at kappa and antagonist at mu so we'll call this drug a mixed agonist antagonist similarly you have pentazosin same kappa agonist and mu antagonist the next one is butorphenol is a kappa agonist mu antagonist follow this arrow mu antagonist and is also antagonist at the delta receptor and the last one is nilorfen which is agonist at kappa and antagonist at mu as well as delta so these four arrows that was the purpose of drawing these four arrows trying to show you that there are some drugs which are appearing on the both sides that's agonist and antagonist and i hope my point is quite clear we now go to the right side and have a look at the 
antagonist. Follow the slide. On the right side, in the mu antagonist, I have written three drugs. These are the only three which we did not look up in red colors. And this is naloxone, naltrexone, and nalmifene. Naloxone, naltrexone, and nalmifene. Easy to remember, all starting with the spelling N. And these are antagonists at mu receptors. We go to the next row, that's kappa receptor, come to the antagonist, naloxone, naltrexone, nalmifen. Let's go down the delta receptor, antagonist, naloxone, naltrexone, nalmifen. And the last receptor, sigma, go to the antagonist, naloxone, naltrexone, nalmifen. Why am I laughing? I hope you understood. They are appearing in the each of the boxes, then the red color I have shown you, and everywhere they are appearing only on one side, and they are the antagonist. The one is they are appearing at all the boxes, at all the receptors, which means these are the drugs which block all subtypes of opioid receptors. This is what we saw in the beginning. Then you start calling a drug as a pure antagonist because it blocks all the receptors. So let's have a have an overview. In this table, to this table, we have mu agonist, which are most probably used as the analgesic drugs. Most important, strong agonist, morphine, pethidine, methadone, and fentanyl, moderate oxycodone and codeine, weak propoxyphene, and a partial agonist, buprenorphine, is also analgesic. If you come to the other side, the antagonist, naloxone, naltrexone, nalmifen, blocking all the subtypes of the opioid receptor. They are pure antagonist. You have nalbufen, pentazosin, butorphenol, and nalorphen appearing on both sides. Somewhere it's agonist, most probably it's agonist at kappa, and many of the drugs are antagonist at either mu receptor or a delta receptor. So these are the mixed agonist antagonist. Out of all these drugs, I want you to remember a drug called pentazosin. This is a very important, very useful drug. Pentazosin is a kappa agonist and it's a mu antagonist. We saw in the beginning, analgesia is transmitted by a number of these receptors. Important receptors which transmit analgesia is mu and kappa. Pentazosin stimulates kappa receptor but blocks mu receptor. So even though it's blocking mu receptor, doesn't make a difference because it's got agonistic action on the kappa receptor and kappa receptor itself is sufficient to give you adequate analgesia, which may be probably spinal analgesia uh, most predominantly. So pentazosin is also an analgesic and I want you to remember pentazosin also along with all other strong, moderate and weak agonist. I think you will find with this table you can try practicing this table yourself and try filling up the caps and probably the plan will be clear in front of your mind who is agonist, who is antagonist, who is mixed agonist, antagonist. Uh, should I go to the next slide? Yeah. Here are the opioid or opiate receptors. Mu and delta, both the receptors, are responsible for transmitting supraspinal analgesia, is a sense of euphoria respiratory depression and physical dependence. Uh, the mu receptors are of two types, that's mu1 transmitting mainly analgesia and mu2 transmitting the, mainly the respiratory depression. As I just said, the kappa receptor is also responsible for analgesia and that's mostly spinal analgesia. In addition to this, an important kappa action is meiosis, that's constriction of pupil and sedation. The last one, that sigma receptor, transmits dysphoria, hallucinations, respiratory depression, and vas vasomotor stimulation. I hope you're looking at the slide, which is trying to tell you that mu, delta, and kappa, all the receptors are responsible, responsible for analgesia. Mu and delta, mostly supraspinal analgesia, and kappa, mostly spinal analgesia. Mu and delta are also responsible for respiratory depression and the euphoric effects and the physical dependence. Whereas kappa is mainly important in meiosis and sedation. So after clarifying 
the types and the subtypes of the receptors, you need to know where are they present. They are present in the limbic system, including the amygdala nucleus, the hypothalamus, the medial and lateral hypothalamus, the area postrema, that's chemoreceptor trigger zone, nucleus of tractus solitarius, that's your cough center, and substantia nigra, and spinal cord. All these are places, important places in the CNS for the opioid receptors. In the past, warfarin was available only for parenteral route of administration. And we did not, did not have any other route of administration. Now you also have morphine which is available as tablets and you have morphine available by the buccal route of administration. Let's go on to discuss morphine in details. What I am going to do is, I am considering morphine as the prototype and let's presume they are the classical actions of narcotic analgesics. First, let's have a look at the acute effects of morphine. The first important effect for which we are considering morphine and it's also written here on the board is analgesia, narcotic analgesics. Analgesia is relief from pain, relief from pain. And the prefix is narcotic. The word narcosis means central nervous system depression. So this drug is going to the CMS. It's depressing your central nervous system and producing relief from the pain. The center for the pain is thalamus. And every thalamus has got, has got a decided pain threshold. Morphine is going to raise the pain threshold. So you're not going to feel any pain which is below this level of the pain threshold. So that's in analgesia. Next, dose dependent central nervous system depression. And we use this particular term when we started the central nervous system with sedative and hypnotics. Dose dependent CNS depression. You give a drug in a small dose, it is going to produce just sedation or little larger dose, hypnosis or little larger dose, more and more central nervous system depression. We got to remember the third most important thing with the narcotic analgesics is they are going to depress the central nervous system and when the depression of the central nervous system reaches the medulla and you have your vital centers, you're going to get respiratory depression. That's the most severe thing happening with the narcotic analgesics. Let me ask you if you remember your general pharmacology modules and you remember the drugs with low therapeutic index and high therapeutic index. And morphine was typically included under low therapeutic index. So it's a drug which has got low therapeutic index, it is less safe. It means that the margin between its therapeutic dose and the dose required for the respiratory depression is quite narrow. There is a narrow margin of safety. This is why we need to remember the respiratory depression. Next, most importantly, morphine releases histamine. There are some substances which release histamine from the mast cells in human body. I would like to remind you of another module that is skeletal muscle relaxants in which we discussed detubocularine and the newer neuromuscular blockers. And at that time we said, these drugs release histamine. And when you release histamine, you likely get two effects. Number one, spasm of the bronchus, bronchial smooth muscle. So that's called bronchospasm. And you're likely to get vasodilation. Exactly. So that is what happens with morphine also. Histamine release leading to hypertension and peripheral vasodilation. This peripheral vasodilation in the veins and the arteries decreases the preload on the heart and the afterload on the heart. And the last effect is bronchospasm. So all these effects, acute effects of morphine, are not its own effects. It's going to be due to the histamine release. The next action of morphine is a cough suppressant action. I hope you remember I showed you the places where the receptors are present and they are also present in the cough center and morphine is a depressant so it's going to suppress the cough. Anyone, anyone ask you about the actions of morphine, do say cough suppressant but if someone asks you uses of morphine, don't say it's used to suppress the cough. It's not affordable to use a drug which is producing so, producing so much of addiction, so much of respiratory depression to suppress your cough. You get better drugs to suppress the cough. Let me remind you of the cough suppressants. You had narcotic antidepressives and non-narcotic antidepressives. 
So go to choose a non-narcotic substance to suppress the cough. So although it appears here as an action of morphine, we are not going to apply it for the therapeutic use. The next effect of morphine is in the gastrointestinal tract and it decreases the motility of the gastrointestinal tract. The result is going to be, if you use morphine for a long period of time, is going to lead to constipation. 